at 2.30 in the morning on Thursday, October 30th, 1947. Tacoma police officers Andrew Sabudis and Evan Skip Davies were dispatched to 1007 as 21st Street to investigate reports of screams emanating from inside the residence. As they approached, a barefoot man ran out of the back door into the backyard and crashed through a picket fence. The two patrolmen immediately gave chase. After scaling several more backyard fences, the fugitive was finally stopped by a high fence and cornered in an alley behind 2122 SJ Street. He pulled out a jackknife and then attacked the officers, cutting Davies' hand and stabbing Sabudis in the shoulder. Officer Sabudis, a former prizefighter known as Tiny Lamar, subdued the assailant with a left hook to the jaw and a kick in the groin. After the fight, the prisoner was taken to the Tacoma General Hospital by Officer John Hickey in a patrol wagon, where he received treatment for head and face lacerations. Sabudis was admitted to St. Joseph Hospital with a severe back wound and Davies had the cuts on his hand stitched and bandaged there. When police officers entered the residence, they found Bertha Clut, age 52, dead in her bedroom adjacent to the kitchen, and the body of her daughter, Beverly June Clut, age 17, on the kitchen floor. Both women had been bludgeoned to death with an axe which had been left at the crime scene. Detective Lieutenant Earl Cornelison determined that an attempt had been made to have non-consensual sex with Bertha Clut before she was intentionally slain. Beverly June, hearing her mother's screams, apparently dashed from her upstairs bedroom into the kitchen, where she encountered the assailant and was murdered. The man captured by officers Sabudis and Davies was identified as Jake Bird, a 45-year-old transient who had a lengthy criminal record including burglaries, assaults, attempted murder, and murder. Bird estimated he had served about 15 years in various prisons for committing crimes. He was born in Louisiana and left home when he was 19 years old. Over the ensuing years, Bird never stayed in one place for long, preferring the life of an itinerant worker. Often he found employment with the railroad as a section gang laborer, which allowed him to earn money and keep moving from town to town. It was an occupation that lent itself quite well to his avocation, stalking and murdering women in the towns he visited. Bird was interrogated by Detective Lieutenant Sherman Lyons at the Tacoma City Jail, where he dictated and signed a confession in the presence of four police officers. His confession stated that he entered the Clut residence through the unlocked back door to commit an easy burglary. He brought along an axe that he found in a nearby shed to bluff off anyone who tried to bother him. Removing his shoes, Bird sneaked into Bertha Clut's bedroom and stole one dollar and fifty cents from her purse. When he returned to the kitchen, he turned around and found Bertha standing behind him. Bert told her that he only wanted her money and his shoes, and then he would leave. But then suddenly Beverly June grabbed him from behind and a fierce struggle ensued, resulting in the deaths of the two women. Bird added that he thought the policemen would shoot him when they had him cornered in the bushes, so he attacked them with his knife. On Friday, October 31, 1947, Deputy Prosecutor Earl Mann charged Jake Bird in Pierce County Superior Court with first-degree murder, but only in the death of Bertha Clut. It was customary to file only one charge in multiple homicides where failure to obtain a conviction on the first offense would allow the filing of additional murder charges. Judge Edward Hodge appointed James Selden, a former Pierce County prosecutor, as his defense counsel. At his arraignment, Bird pleaded not guilty and the trial was set for Monday, November 24, 1947. At a motion hearing on November 14, 1947, defense attorney Selden requested a change of venue, stating Bird could not get a fair trial in Pierce County. He also asked to be relieved as Bird's attorney, informing the court that Bird wanted to represent himself. Judge Hodge denied both requests. Trial began on schedule in the Pierce County Courthouse before Judge Hodge, but was slowed by jury selection. Questioning of the prospective jurors revolved around their impressions of the crime gained from the news media and whether Jake Bird, a black man, could get a fair trial. Four jurors were excused when it was learned they had recently served on another first-degree murder trial in which the defendant was convicted and sentenced to hang. By the end of the day, a jury of nine men and three women was selected and court was recessed until nine o'clock the next morning. Trial proceeded at a rapid pace and was concluded in just one and a half days of testimony. Prosecuting attorney Patrick M. Steele's strategy was to prove that the death of Bertha Clut was premeditated, thereby qualifying the defendant for the death penalty. 
Weighing heavily in the trial was evidence regarding the murder of 17-year-old Beverly June Clut, who was bludgeoned to death in the kitchen when she came to her mother's defense. Blood and brain tissue from both victims were found on Bird's clothing, his bloody fingerprints were found in the house and on the axe, and his shoes were found at the murder scene. The state introduced a surprise witness, Tacoma Police Officer John Hickey, who testified that he and Officer Russell Scadham gave Bird a beating while he was in their custody. Hickey said, I regret to say that I lost my temper after returning from the Clut home and viewing the terribly hacked bodies of the two women. I asked Bird as we sat in the patrol wagon why he murdered the two women. He said he didn't do it. I asked him who did it then, and he said it was Leroy. Who's Leroy? I asked him. Another negro around town, Bird replied. You're lying. And he looked at me with a smug and insolent look. I know I shouldn't have done it, but I hit him in the jaw with my fist, knocking him to the front of the patrol wagon. Then I struck him a number of times with my nightstick until he said, Don't kill me. That brought me to my senses and we took him to the hospital where a nurse said he wasn't badly hurt. Later, when Prosecutor Steele moved to enter Bird's signed confession into evidence, defense attorney Selden strenuously objected, declaring it had been obtained under duress and therefore inadmissible. But Judge Hodge disagreed, ruling there was no relationship between the beating and Bird's voluntary confessions and admitted it into evidence. Despite continued strenuous objections by Selden, the confession was read into the record. Then the prosecution rested its case. Defense attorney Selden rested the defense without calling Bird or any other witnesses to the stand. Closing arguments were begun on Wednesday morning, November 26, 1947, and the case went to the jury at noon. After deliberating for only 35 minutes, the jury returned its verdict. Bird was found guilty of first-degree murder, and the jury voted to impose the death penalty. Bird, who had been impassive throughout the trial, sat unmoved as the judge Hodge read the verdict. On his way back to the Pierce County Jail, Bird asked the five deputy sheriffs guarding him, What's all the excitement about? On December 6, 1947, Judge Hodge sentenced Bird to be hanged on the gallows at the Washington State Penitentiary on January 16, 1948. After a motion for a new trial was denied by Judge Hodge, defense attorney Selden told the court he had done everything in his power to defend Byrd and that no further appeals would be made on Byrd's behalf. Then Selden declared, I feel whenever any 45-year-old man gets an idea that no lives are safe to anyone except his own, that man is a detriment to society and should be obliterated. When Judge Hodge asked Byrd for comment, he declared, I was given no chance to defend myself. My own lawyers just asked you to hang me. They apologized for defending me. If they were so reluctant to defend me, why did they contest the prosecutor's proof of murder and now say that everything is proven? At the end of his 20-minute impassioned speech, Bird declared, All you guys who had anything to do with this case are going to die before I do. It became known as the Jake Bird Hex. Within a year, five men connected with Bird's trial died. On Sunday, December 7, 1947, Pierce County under Sheriff Joseph Carpatch and Deputy Michael Wavereck took Bird in a patrol wagon to the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla to await his execution. Shortly after his arrival, Bird began confessing to his involvement in a dozen murders that took place over a span of 20 years. On January 6, 1948, at the request of Governor Monrad Charles Walgren, Pierce County Prosecutor Patrick Steele and Tacoma Police Detective Lieutenant Sherman Lyons went to the penitentiary to listen to confessions. In an obvious bid for a reprieve, Bird offered to tell them more to clear his conscience. Steele told the press, We want to give him a chance to tell it, but we don't intend to permit him to use what he might have withheld as a means to add a few days to his life. Over the next several days, Steele and Lyons took voluminous notes on Byrd's statements, which they compiled into a 174-page report for the governor's office. On January 15, 1948, Byrd finally won a 60-day reprieve from Governor Walgren by claiming that, given time, he could clear up at least 44 murders that he either committed or participated in during his travels throughout the country. His confessions brought a throng of investigators from across the nation to interview him at the state penitentiary. Of these 44 confessed murders, only 11 were substantiated, but Byrd had more than enough knowledge about the others to be the prime suspect. Police from several states took the opportunity to close the books on many of their unsolved murders. 
In his travels, Bird had murdered people, mostly women, in Illinois, Kentucky, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, South Dakota, Ohio, Florida, Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, and Washington. Meantime, Bird appealed his conviction to the Washington State Supreme Court. He personally argued his case before the Supreme Court justices, stating that Judge Hodge had made several judicial errors and demanded a new trial. On November 30, 1948, his final petition to the state for a retrial was denied, and on December 3, 1948, Judge Hugh Rosalini signed another death warrant, ordering Byrd to be hanged on January 14, 1949. Byrd's attorney, Murray Taggart of Walla Walla, immediately moved for a stay of execution to permit the filing of an appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals. The motion was granted on the condition the court agreed to review the case. When the U.S. Court of Appeals refused to review the case, Judge Rosalini set Byrd's execution date for July 15, 1949. Attorney Taggart requested another stay of execution to permit the filing of an appeal with the U.S. Supreme Court, but the motion was denied. Undeterred, Taggart filed three more petitions on Byrd's behalf, but the U.S. Supreme Court refused to review the case the last time, on July 14, 1949. Byrd's last hope was an act of executive clemency from Governor Arthur B. Langley, but Langley chose not to interfere with the execution. On Thursday night, July 14, 1949, Jake Byrd ate his last meal on death row and then talked with his attorney for two hours. Byrd told Taggart he could be a good loser as long as he felt everything possible had been done to save his life. Later that night, he was moved to a holding cell near the gallows, where he was shaved and dressed in new clothes. Just after midnight, Bird walked ten feet from the cell to the gallows accompanied by Warden Tom Smith and two prison guards. He said nothing to the 125 witnesses who had gathered in the room, but muttered some comment to one of the guards. A volunteer prison chaplain, Reverend Arvid O'Neill, started to read a note from Bird, declaring he bore no malice toward anyone and sought forgiveness. But before he finished, the trapdoor was sprung, dropping Bird five feet to his death. Jake Bird was hanged at 12.20 on July 15, 1949. His body was taken down 14 minutes later, and prison physician Dr. Elmer Hill pronounced him dead. He was buried in an unmarked grave in the prison cemetery, identified only as convict number 21520. Bird willed his personal fortune, $6.15, to his appeals attorney, Murray Taggart. Although not formally educated, Byrd gained a modicum of fame as a jailhouse lawyer, often arguing his own case before the court. His knowledge of the law, together with the help of people against the death penalty, enabled him to delay his execution a year and a half. Byrd's case failed to capture the attention of the national press, even though he confessed to committing or being involved in at least 44 murders throughout the country. But history marks him as one of the nation's most prolific serial killers. The five men connected with Byrd's trial who died within a year of the Jake Byrd hex were Edward D. Hodge, Pierce County Superior Court Judge, age 69, Joseph E. Carpatch, Pierce County Under Sheriff, age 46, George L. Harrigan, Pierce County Court Reporter, age 69, Sherman W. Lyons, Tacoma Police Detective Lieutenant, age 46, James W. Selden, Byrd's Defense Attorney, age 76. All of the men died from heart attacks, and a sixth man, Arthur Stewart, a Washington State Penitentiary guard assigned to death row, died of pneumonia two months before Byrd's execution. Mm -hmm.